Today's episode is brought to you by Audible.com. Get a free audiobook download and 30-day free trial at audibletrial.com slash 1PVS2P. Over 180,000 titles to choose from for your iPhone, Android, Kindle, or MP3 player. Again, that's audibletrial.com slash 1PVS2P. Thanks to Audible for supporting our podcast, and thanks to you for supporting us. Go listen to a book. A leaked PlayStation report confirms an upgraded PS4 is on the way. The Xbox 360 ends its decade-long run. And the developer behind Bastion and Transistor announced their next game, Pyre. All that plus more today, Wednesday, April 27th, 2016. You're listening to the 1P vs. 2P Podcast. I'm Taylor Ray. With me, as always, is my brother and co-host, Ryan Ray. Let's begin with... First attack. Our top stories from this past week. This is an old story at this point, but GiantBomb.com reported that Sony is referring to a new upgraded PS4 codenamed Neo, N-E-O, which contains an upgraded CPU, GPU, and RAM. Ryan, why don't you go through what we're supposed to expect out of this new thing? So it seems like there's going to be an incremental upgrade to the PS4, and there will be two types of PS4 games available from October 2016 moving forward, uh, if this report is to be believed. Uh, so two types of PS4 games will be available, those that can run on any PS4, the base model and the Neo model, and those that take advantage of the newer console's extra power. So the report is kind of unclear whether or not this Neo is going to be a whole new console, or just a Switch, or a new mode, but basically... Developers aren't going to be allowed to make Neo only exclusive games. Games that are being made for the PS4 moving forward are going to have to work both on the base model and the Neo model. And there's going to be no back and forth uh, as far as exclusive modes. Uh, if there is a better frame rate on the Neo mode, there has to also, the game also has to run well on the base model. It seems like that older titles that weren't developed when this was brought up with, with the Neo stuff... Those versions of those games will also have to work uh, on the Neo uh, with a patch. So it seems like Sony is kind of doubling back, maybe coming back to some requests from developers uh, saying we need more power out of the PS4 if we're going to continue to support this platform. But honestly, I'm not sure who really is asking for this. It seems to be really confusing, and Sony has been very mum uh, since this has come out. Exactly. This is a report from an anonymous source. It would have helped if Sony came out in front of this and said, look, okay, there was this leak, and now, yes, it, we can confirm there's this Neo console coming out later this year. I expect they'll announce something at E3 at this point because they have said nothing, and it's been a week just so far. This Neo, this PS4 Neo, is reportedly going to put out stuff in 4K. So, in my opinion, I think what Sony is trying to do is sell you more on 4K content and sell you Sony branded 4K TVs. That, that's my best guess as to why they're trying to do this. Because the PlayStation is such a strong brand, when it comes to the PS4, it can sell other hardware. And we already know about the, the PlayStation VR, and I think it's a business move uh, to that effect. However, I suspect it's going to be tough for developers going forward that have to not only support like a base mode version of a games going forward, but also this Neo mode, which I, I hope look good. I hope it's worth it because it's hard to justify. What is it? Is it a $400 price tag? Is that right? Right now, I think the current model of PS4 sells for about $350. You can, of course, get it uh, bundled and ch for cheaper than that. Yeah, it, it just seems like they're creating uh, another skew. You know, eventually when the Neo comes out, they might eventually drop the base model. We've had incremental upgrades on consoles for a long time, but this just feels different. You know, Nintendo has kind of really pioneered this. You remember with the uh, Game Boy Advance, they eventually sold the uh, Game Boy Advance SP. Uh, you know, they seem to do this with pretty much every uh, Nintendo platform. You know, think the 3DS, the 3DS XL, now the new 3DS XL. It really kind of uh, scatters the market when you do this. And this just feels uh, especially different because the PS4 is only about three or four years into its life cycle. Uh, the last console generation lasted about uh, nine or ten years. The PS4 is really, really kicking the butt of Microsoft's Xbox One. 
And since this news came out, it seems like both players and developers are not on board for this. It just seems to be really, really confusing. And there was no indication in this report whether or not uh, this was going to be tied specifically to uh, improve the frame rate of games on PSVR. No indication of that. Uh, you know, I, I think a lot of console games on the PS4, a lot of multi-platform games are locked right now behind uh, 30 frames per second because these consoles are basically, were underpowered from the start. And this, these specs that we're reading here, if they're to be believed, will bring this console right in line with a PC that's running about a 970 uh, graphics card, which is kind of a high-end graphics card right now at the moment. But when it comes out, it may already be outdated. So it, it's hard to say what this news will really bring. It just feels like a really weird time in console gaming. And I don't think this is what people who buy consoles really sign up for. They just want a closed box that you can just plug in and play, and you don't have to figure out all this extra stuff. And if it's a Switch, or it's a new set of games, or whatever it is, you know, how are you going to really bring people on board for this? It is going to be confusing. There is that still, that console market there for more casual gamers that's not interested in going the PC route, that incremental upgrades where you can just, like, replace the graphics card, for instance, or uh, spend a little more money and upgrade the RAM. But the appeal for me is that, like, I I'm when I was once really steered towards console-only games, now I'm kind of steered to PC when there, there are moves like this that are announced. It, it just seems like spitting out that amount of money for a console when their PC counterparts are not only cheaper in most cases, but perform better. It seems like developers are still focusing on uh, their PC versions as their marquee titles. And and I'm just really, really afraid that what's going to happen with, with uh, this Neo mode and the base mode games not only is going to cause confusion for anyone looking to buy a new PS4, but developers are going to either one is going to suffer over the other version. That's what I'm trying to get at here. It honestly kind of makes me regret my PS4 purchase about two years ago. And it's only been three years since it's been out. Like, I got it around when Destiny was was launched, and kind of like what you alluded to before, this thing, it's not the first time this has ever happened. There's been a lot of cases uh, in the industry of people putting out incremental like uh, changes to their platforms. Let me, let me run through these, uh, just a few of these that I looked up. The Game Boy, right? The Game Boy Color had a color model. The N64 had that uh, expansion pack, and some titles required you to use it. Like, the 360, the 360 had, like, a lot of revisions, right? There was the core that, like, even stripped out features. Like, it totally removed the hard drive, only had, like, this 4-gig internal flash. It, it's not like this thing is unprecedented, but it, it seems way out of left field for Sony to do this when they're way out in first place. And also, when it comes to branding this thing, we don't know if Neo is going to be the absolute uh, final name for this thing. That's the code name for now. I'm also afraid what's going to happen is that they're going to pull a Nintendo, where Nintendo had this Wii versus Wii U, and then it was the Nintendo 3DS versus 3DS XL versus the new Nintendo 3DS XL. It's just so confusing for, for people to, to sift through these things and wonder whether or not they're making an investment and whether or not it's going to let them play the games they want to play, really. I have two final thoughts on this, and then we'll move on. Uh, I, I'm really afraid that this is going to be a situation like with Hyrule Warriors Legends on 3DS right now, where technically it's playable on the older model of the system, but it has a really bad frame rate. The graphics don't run as well. The load times are incredibly unbelievable. Uh, I hope this is not the situation with games moving forward on PS4. And my, my second thought on this is, frankly, Sony could have just put out a sign when this report came out and said, okay, we're done selling PS4s until October, until this Neo mode comes out. Because if I was uh, somebody interested in buying a PS4 or I bought one within the past two weeks and this news came out, I would be super angry. Uh, it would It would be... Right, a good consumer move for Sony to uh, institute some sort of trade-in program uh, where you got some amount of value back towards maybe a Neo upgrade. But there really isn't a precedent for uh, console manufacturers to do this. Of course, uh, third-party uh, retailers like GameStop or Amazon might have trade-in programs, but frankly, there are a lot of PS4 PS4s out there. I think the last number I read was something about 34 million sold in the U.S. alone. That's a lot of customers that are now super confused about what's the the, pl the plan for the platform moving forward. I don't want to really want to buy a PS4 game 
until more of this news comes out. And that's a huge bummer because there's some super exclusive uh, PS4 games that are coming out. Final Fantasy XV is uh, being heavily promoted on on the Sony platform, and that is not coming to the PC. Is that game going to run in Neo mode? I'm not sure. Is there going to be a mode just on the base PS4 model? Again, we have no idea. Uh, you know, Star Ocean, that's another game that I'm looking forward to. Again, no news on that. This Neo mode just throws everything into a big, confusing mess. Well, let's segue from those JRPGs you mentioned, because we'll talk about some of the classics from the last console generation, which was the 360 generation that dominated, right? It was Microsoft that was in first place back then. So right after 10 and a half years, Microsoft is ending production of 360, coming from the head of Xbox, Phil Spencer. He said, quote, Xbox 360 means a lot to everyone in Microsoft. And while we've had an amazing run, the realities of manufacturing a product over a decade old are starting to creep up on us, which is why we've made the decision to stop manufacturing new 360 consoles. We will continue to sell existing inventory of Xbox 360 consoles with availability varying by country, end quote. But also what this means is that it's okay if you're still a 360 owner and if you still play games on it because Xbox Live will remain active, but uh, also the uh, the live stores and also online services, that's all going to remain the same. So Ryan, let's reminisce about the 360. What do you remember most about the console? I remember getting really excited to uh, buy the, the console to play both Geometry Wars, and I also remember being super impressed by the graphics in Gears of War. Uh, I was in college when the 360 came out, and I saw somebody playing Gears of War, and I was just like, man, I have to play this game. I have to get this console. And when I got it, it had a the 360 had a UI that was so completely different than other console UIs. You know, we were coming off of the, the PlayStation 2 and the original Xbox, which uh, basically just had, like, clocks and memory management and didn't have anything as far as... Um, like an OS level. And that if you remember, the Xbox 360 launched with all those blades. Um, it came with uh, copies of Hexic, which was also a great, great launch title. Uh, launched with a bunch of other uh, really cool games. Uh, Uno, uh, Geometry War is definitely the highlight for me. And it, it brought, brought forth a lot of really, really cool games that basically won out the, the generation for the next 10 years or so. Um, you know, every multi-platform game that came out uh, the Xbox 360 came a few years before the PS3, and then when the PS3 came out, it was a lot more expensive, and the 360 had a lot more to offer. It was already in so many people's homes at that point. People were used to the controller. Uh, people were already playing Halo and Gears and all, the, all these other great Microsoft titles that uh, really, really sold people on the console. I remember the Blades. You mentioned that uh, before. I really miss that that dashboard. I thought it was... I thought it was excellent, and I was so sad when they, they went back and patched it, and now you have this more universal tile layout, and yeah, I was not a huge fan when they did that, but I, I remember that, but I also want to highlight that Xbox Live really had strong social integration, like friends list right in the forefront, the party chats, like PS3 was just light years behind, and also 360s, if you remember, were bundled with headsets as well, right out of the box, and I think that gave them a distinct advantage over the over the PS3. It really encouraged you to play online multiplayer with a lot of folks, and that's something that I think the PS3 lacked. So uh, I also remember being really hooked on achievement gathering. I know, Ryan, you used to really go after some achievements and try to S rank and, and complete all... Uh, uh, every possible achievement out of every game if you enjoyed it that much. Like, I remember those specifically. I'm no longer like that now, but... Uh, Mass Effect also, you remember Mass Effect 1 on 360? Absolutely. And the Call of Duty series, like, it just holds a special place in my heart for a console shooter. Like, it was just incredible on, on the 360. But let's also talk about the bad, because there were some bad things on the 360. In this nostalgic lens, it's, it's kind of hard to overlook these things, right? The Red Ring of Death, man, that cost Microsoft a ton of money, but I think Having There was this really clear avenue on repairing their consoles at no cost to the consumer, which was a positive, but it's really unfortunate if you were like me, who ha this happened twice, and it's just a huge hassle waiting for that replacement Xbox uh, to arrive back. Also, it was kind of noisy anyway, like even if you didn't get that Red Ring of Death, those fans out of the, that like launch model, 
was so loud. Right. The, the, the 360 was probably the console that I bought the most versions of. I went through a two 360, actually three 360s uh, with the Red Ring of Death. The first one, I, uh, you know, of course, when that debacle happened, uh, there was all those uh, internet rumors about wrapping your 360 in a towel to make sure it would overheat so it would kind of get past the Red Ring, but that would also make the console worse. And uh, eventually, Microsoft, when I complained, Microsoft sent me the infamous 360 coffin, which was this box that you packaged your 360 in and you would get a refurbished replacement back. I'm not sure that they really made good on it, but they at least tried to give you a, a replacement console. Um, and then, uh, you know, two 360s that I bought afterwards uh, also each red ringed individually, but those were outside of the warranty. There was only about a two year span where they did the red ring program. And uh, then I was out that money. And I, I basically bought, I think, six consoles in total if we count Red Rings and console revisions. There was a eventual revision, uh, like you said before, that uh, eliminated the uh, removable hard drive uh, that had more more uh, gigabytes inside. There was also a version that shipped with the Kinect. Uh, the Kinect was also during this generation, um, you know, one that was bundled with. And then eventually they sold the, the standalone Kinect camera uh, outside that. I think every time I bought a 360 console, I knew that I was still so tied to my massive, massive library of games because a lot of people had 360s and a lot of, you know, I just watched my game, my digital library build up so much. Games, everything from Castlevania Symphony of Night, a port of that was on the 360. There were just, a, there was just a huge back catalog of games that developers really wanted to sell to the mass market. And the way you had to do that was being on Xbox Live. I didn't know you had six different 360s, but that includes the ones you had to, you got replacements for through the Red Ring program, right? Right. Yeah. And it wasn't cheap. It was, I, at the time, it was about $300 a piece. So uh, I spent a lot of money on 360s over the 10 years. Oh, man. But if you had to look back, was it worth it? Did you get a lot for your money? Yeah. I'd have to say uh, probably that some of the standout games for me Mass Effect 2, uh, Banjo Kazooie, Nuts and Bolts. You know, Halo, Halo 3, definitely a huge highlight. That came out one uh, holiday season. If you remember, also, that was also the holiday when uh, Xbox Live went down for about two weeks, right around the release of Halo 3. That was also a hot garbage fire. Um, <laughs> it, it just seemed like the 360 was kind of the generation where a lot of stuff happened as far as uh, games being available online. A lot of DLC happened. Uh, you know, Oblivion, uh, all that, that noise, that 360 version of Oblivion was also... Uh, pretty close to launch, and I remember spending hours and hours playing that game and remembering all the, the hullabaloo about the Horse Armor DLC and wondering if I would eventually, when I left college, if I would have internet that could support uh, playing online with people. Uh, there was, there was, a, there was a, a lot of stuff that happened as far as internet infrastructure and as far as uh, playing games with friends that happened basically because of the 360's existence and popularity. Well, Microsoft, they built upon the Xbox Live infrastructure very well with the original Xbox. They experimented a lot with the Xbox. They didn't have the install base there, but I think it really set the stage to make 360 super successful in that generation. So uh, last but not least, I just want to mention a few other things and then we'll move on. The Kinect, that was just hot garbage. Very few titles put out for that. The Kinect just did not work very well. It was very title dependent. Some worked well, some just did not work at all. Like Steel Battalion is a great example. That was just a horrible, horrible implementation for that game. But then you look at Gunstringer, that actually worked pretty well, and it was a relatively fun game. And also we saw the advent of season passes that were being sold. I'm not sure if this was at the same time when PS3 also offered that at the same time, but... And also we saw a lot of exclusive DLC that was only available on Xbox Live versus PSN. So it could be a positive or negative, positive for them, I'm sure, because they made a ton of money off of that stuff. A negative for a lot of consumers because they felt like they had to make some hard choices on which platform to buy the stuff on. But yeah, after, what is it, just over 10 years, Microsoft ending 360 production, really, really an end of an era. All right, enough about that. Let's move on to our new game announcements. Here comes a new challenger! This week, we're skipping new game releases. We didn't find anything that was really noteworthy that we wanted to talk about, but let's start off with the new ones that were announced, including Pyre, which is uh, the next RPG from Supergiant Games. 
These are the developers of Bastion and Transistor. A huge fan of both of those games, by the way. So this is coming to PS4 and PC. It was showed at PAX East this past weekend. It's being described as Oregon Trail meets NBA Jam. Yeah, it seems to be some kind of uh, fantasy sports game that stars uh, like a group of uh, teams of three that, that are kind of uh, battling in this purgatory court thing. And they they compete against other refugees for their freedom. I think that's the kind of the RPG story element of it. From the footage in the trailer, it kind of looks like they're they're playing like a game of rugby or football. It, it's it's really hard to tell. And uh, from what I've heard about it, the the controls are basically kind of like uh, rubbing your head and scratching your belly at the same time. Uh, you you have to kind of figure out how to pass the ball, how to how to score points. Uh, and I'm I'm really curious how they're gonna make an RPG. Uh, how the trappings of an RPG are going to work in a in a sports game, but that potentially could be really cool. I I really liked both Bastion and Transistor. Uh, maybe Bastion a little more. Transistor didn't do a whole lot for me. The Super Giant Games guys always make these very stylistic stylistic games, and uh, they're usually pretty pretty fun to play. Super Giant Games puts out stylish stuff, so I'm looking forward to this one. And you have to see the trailer for yourself, so make sure you click on the link in the show notes to, to check it out. We'll, we'll make sure to link it there. Uh, let's move on to Ruiner, which is an isometric action game that plays like a stylish blend of Hotline Miami meets that anime Akira or Akira. It's this uh, dual stick shooter. Also, it's being published by Devolver Digital. Ryan, take it away. What, what else about this game? Yeah, so basically it sounds like uh, this is going to be kind of a uh, cyberpunk world that you'll be playing in. It looks very similar to that Shadow, those Shadowrun games that came out recently on PC. And uh, basically you're going to be playing as this like hacker and you're looking for your brother. Uh, it sounds actually a lot like the plot of Transistor a little bit, <laughs> speaking of the, uh, the last game that we talked about. But uh, basically you're going to be uh, working with augments and you're going to have like a quick dash to escape from enemies and uh, attacks and an energy shield. It, this is being developed by quite a pedigree of former game developers. You know, the, the team is made up of former Witcher, Dying Light, This War of Mine, and Shadow Warrior uh, devs. So I, I'm super looking forward to this. This looks very, very cool. Uh, it seems like a lot of the new hot genre, uh, Take Zombies Down, uh, was put the, the cyberpunk genre back up on top. This, looks, this game looks really cool. The developer is called Rikon, R A I. K-O-N. They're from Poland. So uh, Gearbox this past weekend announced at uh, a PAX East panel, uh, their CEO, Randy Pitchford, also announced on Twitter that Borderlands 3 is coming. That's really honestly not a huge surprise there. But uh, he confirmed also on Twitter that Battleborn art director Scott Kester is moving on to work on this game. And there's also going to be supposedly some Borderlands 3 Easter eggs in Battleborn DLC, but we don't know much more beyond that. Would you be excited to play a new Borderlands? I think the uh, pre-sequel killed a lot of the excitement for me for a new Borderlands. Yeah, I always think there's room for more loot-based games, first-person shooters, obviously. The prequel, like you said, yeah, it was just not so good. Wasn't a huge fan of the Telltale Adventure game uh, for Borderlands either, Tales from Borderlands. Um, but yeah, we don't know when it's coming. Yeah, uh, we don't we don't know more details beyond they're definitely working on it. All right, Taylor, let's talk about what we've been playing. Uh, it's been a while since we've done this segment, but you've been playing Clash Royale. Tell me about that. Oh man, I've been super addicted to that game. It's one of these free-to-play games that constantly notifies you. I, I might have to disable the notifications because I find myself... Uh, constantly checking on my phone to unlock chests. So what this game is, is this is this card-based tower defense game. So what you have is three different towers at the bottom of the screen, and you need to defeat your opponent's towers uh, before the, the game time runs out. And there's some interesting mechanics in this game, like you're constantly collecting cards uh, to play, and what you have is you have this ever-growing meter that allows you to play uh, certain cards. And depending on how powerful the card is, it's going to cost more uh, uh, of your power to play. They call it elixir. That's what this, this power meter is. And what you have is this really tactical back and forth of your enemy playing plays a unit and you need to counter it with, uh, with something that can easily defeat it before it reaches your towers to blow them up. But also there are like different win states. The time can run out and neither of you have defeated 
the opponent's tower. So what you have is you have this overtime mode where it's sudden death, and the first person to blow up a tower uh, wins. It, it can be anywhere from like two to three minutes, so they're very short. The wait time to play games is very short. Honestly, I've never seen it pass like three seconds. You can join a clan and request cards, also battle your friends. It just has a lot of hooks there. I haven't pumped any money into it yet. I don't feel like I've hit a wall. It is really fun, and I highly recommend it as this quick hit game. Of course, there is really no offline mode. You do have to play online only. Seems like an early contender for our guilty pleasure of the year. Oh, absolutely. Like, I feel super guilty constantly checking on my phone. And I find myself like, oh, I'll just play the next game. Oh, I can do a next game because they're only two to three minutes. And and then, sure enough, you know, like 30 minutes passes. I'm like, oh, my God, I made like zero progress. But it was fun nonetheless. So, <laughs> all right, Ryan, tell me about this. You you played Star Fox Zero. Your review is up on our site now. We'll be sure to link to that in the show notes as well. Uh, why don't you summarize uh, what you liked and what you disliked about that game? Taylor, I think if there ever was a contender for our most disappointing game this year, I think Star Fox Zero makes a very strong case for it. Yeah, I wouldn't say it's a completely broken game, It's not, and it's also not a bad game per se. It just does some things that I'd really prefer a Star Fox game not to do. It just feels like, it, basically Star Fox Zero, uh, if you don't know, is a uh, retelling of the events of Star Fox 64, except this time it's out on Wii U. It has kind of an interesting control scheme, and I, I want to really emphasize uh, the interesting aspect of it because... <laughs> All the reviews are talking about it, mine included. Uh, basically, you control uh, the. There's a on the main TV screen. There's kind of the traditional uh, behind the back vehicle view that you you're used to in Star Fox games. And on the gamepad, you're actually seeing a cockpit view as if you were Fox McCloud himself uh, piloting the thing. And that's supposed to be uh, to give you more precise targeting controls. But in practice, it's it's not something that's really. Uh, they don't very. They don't tutorialize you very well. And uh, the game keeps insisting you do it. Your squad mates say, for a more precise shot, you know, go to go to the cockpit view. And it doesn't really give you more precise view. In fact, uh, it, it feels like it's this combination of trying to pilot and shoot at the same time, which was never really a problem in the, in the Star Fox games. But it seems like they're trying to go for this, like, omnidirectional targeting thing. And they've really failed uh, to to really translate that well. And it just it just feels like uh, like a Wii U gimmick that isn't isn't going over well compared to other past star fox games the camera angle was fixed behind your vehicle whether you were in an r-wing or a landmaster tank and then as you moved one stick that's moving not only your vehicle and moving it in a new direction but it's moving the reticle at the exact same time whereas this is also star fox zero combines motion controls as well right right so basically you're moving the targeting reticle with motion controls and you have an option mid battle to re recenter that, but if you recenter the controls while you're you're tilted, all you've basically done is guarantee that you're going to be all turned around. I, I think it, the game's controls are really compounded by the game's horrible, horrible camera. The, on the TV, the main TV screen, it tries to give you a lot of these cinematic angles, and frankly, I just want to be flying the R wing. I don't want to be hassling with figuring out where exactly my shots are going. And that's what it feels like I'm doing. The, the game is super short. It's uh, You can play through it in about uh, three and a half hours. Of course, there are, more, there are alternative branching paths, and the game encourages you to uh, go back and redo levels, get a better score, do kind of bonus objectives to unlock new levels and stuff. But uh, the, the final boss fight, and I don't feel bad spoiling it, uh, but you're, you fight Andros, surprise. Uh, <laughs> the, the fight basically uh, takes place in a slightly different arena than it did in Star Fox 64. And the game, the, the way the, the boss battle works is basically you have to shoot Andross's hands and his brain. But in order to do that, you have to get fly inside into this uh, like tower that Andross has put himself in. And the, the game kind of puts it at the, the entire battle in this like cinematic view. So you're, you're trying to pilot the R-Wing into these small little holes in, in the tower. And then in order to actually precisely shoot at his hands and his weak spots, you have to turn into the chicken walker mode and look on the cockpit to see where you're going. Meanwhile, Andros is trying to crush you with his hands and stuff. And I that was the most times I've died. And it, it felt like I really hadn't mastered the chicken walker controls quite yet. And it, it just seemed like a really bad time to introduce that mechanic. And while I'm trying to have this climactic final battle with Andros. And it just re left a really bad taste in my mouth. 
If you really like Star Fox, that, that is basically the only audience this game is for. If you're a newcomer to the Star Fox games, I, I'd recommend checking out uh, the remake that they did of 64 on 3DS, or basically any other Star Fox game, because Star Fox Zero is basically that, a zero. You, as a veteran of Star Fox, you've played all those games in the past. I can well imagine that anyone who's a newcomer to this game is just going to have a terrible, terrible time with it, and it's really going to sour this. And it's unfortunate for that franchise, really, because it prides itself on multiplayer and like a great, intense dogfighting. And, and so it, it sounds like it was, it was a really big disappointment, and it should have been like a huge, huge proud moment for Nintendo. But the Wii U is just about done, and this was a really failed swan song with, with Star Fox Zero. And that's basically why I gave it two stars. Uh, it's not a broken game. It runs at a steady frame rate. The, the core of what Star Fox is is still in Star Fox Zero. It's just once you get past all the horrible controls and camera angles, basically what you've got is a, a pretty average game. So, uh, yeah, check out our review on the site if you want to know more information. But I wouldn't recommend paying the, the price that they're asking for for Star Fox Zero. Okay, let's wrap this thing up. Ryan, ready for the bonus stage? Yeah, let's end this bad boy. <laughs> Okay, we'll roll with it. Just go. <laughs> you okay. can't laugh. You can't laugh. I just wanted to say something different instead of let's do it. I'm just going to read now. A board game based on Dark Souls has raised more than $2.2 million on Kickstarter. They were only asking for $70,000 and it was funded in just three minutes. Dark Souls the board game comes from Steamforge Games, is officially licensed, and has a lot of the mechanics, including difficulty and bonfires, from the video game. It's coming out April 2017. That's crazy. More than $2 million raised so that people are paying just to, to keep losing at Dark Souls. All right, fine, whatever. <laughs> Rocket League got a new hoops mode earlier this week, which replaces the soccer ball with a basketball and the goal with a hoop and a backboard, which will be updated in as free DLC if you own the game for all platforms, and along with it, a new arena called Dunk House. Does this mean that they're eventually going to do NBA Jam or Space Jam licensed stuff? I officially want that to be Rocket League canon. A new Sega Genesis themed hub, a virtual game room of sorts, is coming to Steam this week. It'll be a 3D recreation of an early 90s Sega fan's bedroom and will include official Steam Workshop mod support for classic Sega games. Anyone who owns a Genesis game, of which there are 50 on Steam, will get the new hub for free. Okay, so how long is it going to take for someone to mod in the Sonic S-A-N-I-C meme in as the Sonic characters? I, yeah. That's going to be the first thing that comes out for this thing. All right, that's it. If you liked our show, please subscribe, rate, and review us on iTunes and Stitcher. Please let us know what you think of our show. It would be a huge help. You can also listen to us on Google Play Music, TuneIn, Clamor, or on our site, which is 1pvs2p.com, or search for us on your favorite podcast app. All of our sources for this week's stories have been posted at the link in the show notes. Like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter at 1pvs2p underscore podcast. Also, check us out on YouTube and Twitch. We just started on Twitch. Twitch.tv slash 1pvs2p underscore podcast for gameplay videos, let's plays, and more. As always, we want to thank Phonetic Hero for the use of his songs for our show, Coffee Stomp, and Super Manly Brothers X. Both songs are part of the compilation project Chip Tunes Equals Win. Thanks for listening, everybody. We'll see you next week.